When we read Pessoa's characters, we get lost in their universes and forget about their author. But they are Pessoa, or aspects of Pessoa, enactments of Pessoa, who made himself into nothing so that he could become everything and everyone. Hi, this is Aisha and welcome to a new video of Reader Day Club. Today I will be talking about the book of Disquiet by Fernando Pessoa. Now before I begin this review, I just want to say that nothing I say, you know, in just the way of an opinion or an interpretation or a review equals to the phenomenal and above all, you know, cathartic writing of Pessoa. Now, this is my second time reading the book of the Square, to be honest. Uh, the first time I read this was last year. And I think that the book of Disquiet is just one of the few books that in my in my list that qualifies as a once a year read. The other book I plan on reading again next year is War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. And I read this book in Jan this year, and uh, this is the Oxford World's Classics edition. Uh, and I plan on reading the Penguin edition of War and Base uh, next year in Jan. So, yes, I'm very excited about that. Second book that is on my list as you know, being a once a year read is Roast that is Swan's Way, that is the first volume. Now again, I read this book in Feb. I think I read it a month after I read War and Peace. And I have, I also have the second volume, which is Within a Budding Grove, but I've not read this one. I want to read a volume a year. So these are my once a year reads. I think, um, I'm not so sure about this next book being a once a year read but i will definitely i definitely want to read it again the book i'm talking about is house of leaves now if you don't know anything about this book it's best to not know anything about this book before you read it because knowing anything about this book will just sort of spoil your experience of the book and it's just it's such an experimental book you know it's it's horror it's psychological it's complex i mean this isn't just words on a page you know you sort of experience it's it's an experience and it's it's so shifty for the lack of a better word it's so bizarre it's so claustrophobic i mean uh it's so elusive i mean i think at this point i'm just throwing words at you but yeah it's it's a it's a great book moving on to Pessoa. The, this book is considered to be Pessoa's posthumous masterpiece. Um, Fernando Pessoa was a Portuguese author who wrote uh, a lot of poetry as well. Now what this book contains are fragments. Uh, fragments of a life lived in multiples, if that makes sense. So the idea of self-multiplication is, you know, when we view ourselves in different ways or in different selves. And that is something that comes up a lot in the Book of Disquiet. Uh, Pessoa not only interacts with, but he dismantles the illusions of a self and just the, uh, you know, just the ephemeral fluctuations of a self. And one of the ways through which he explains this multiplicity of a self is by giving each and every emotion a personality and a soul. I remember writing in the margin of one of the first page, one of the first few pages, oh, I think it's, yeah, here it is, uh, page 21, a quote of uh, Agnes Varda, uh, that is, if we open people up, we'd find landscapes. So, um, I think what Pessoa is doing is he's giving each of these landscapes a self, a personality, a soul, sort of, you know, that so that it transcends this shell that is the physical body and allows one to experience 
thoughts and emotions and feelings in a very different manner you know manner that you know we just aren't aware of these lines of pessoa reminded me of uh, agnes varda's quote if i write what i feel it's to reduce the fever of feeling what i confess is unimportant because everything is unimportant i make landscapes out of what i feel let me also read you something else that i marked and everything becomes a confusing labyrinth where i stray in myself away from myself how many am i who is i what is this gap between me and myself so from this tangent of you know self realization that we are nothing but this this transitory and heterogeneous uh, pile of you know sensations and experiences all packed into a physical body so pessoa uses this from which he shoots off in order to sketch the i think what is the most lucid the most flawless uh, portrait of an individual the entire life of the human soul is mere motions in the shadows we live in a twilight of consciousness never in accord with whom we are or think we are what is this and what good is it who am i when i feel what in me dies when i am like someone on a hill who tries to make out the people in the valley i look down at myself from on high and i'm a hazy and confused landscape just like everything else in these moments when an abyss opens up in my soul the tiniest detail distresses me like a letter of farewell i feel as if i'm always on the verge of waking up i'm oppressed by the very self that encases me asphyxiated by conclusions and i'd gladly scream if my voice could reach somewhere we play hide and seek with no one there's a transcendent trick in all of this a fluid divinity we can only hear in order to better explain to you why this is such a poignant and contemplative read um i just want to mention a few of my favorite things the word disquiet and what it means uh the book of disquiet offers a very you know peculiar a very particular definition of the word disquiet it's very personal it's very intimate that is just never the same for any two people but at the same time it's so it's such a paradox because the way that pessoa describes disquietude it sort of coalesces with a very universal and shared experience of what we know of melancholy and solitude and just uncertainty and it feels very self orienting it feels very relatable and th- that's the thing it's not supposed to feel relatable because pessoa insists on an individual or very subjective experience of the world but it feels relatable in these pages you may not find any explicit reprieve or any clarification about you know why we feel such intense emotions and why we feel so many emotions at the same time at the same time the way that pessoa unravels this experience of disquietude it's more implicit as you're reading pessoa there's just something that changes inside you and you just can't pinpoint exactly when and how that happens but it's powerful it's profound just the same pessoa also insists on the irremediable condition you know of human existence and he recognizes this without trying to anesthetize it like he's not trying to suppress these feelings he's just the way he writes it's simply a recognition that these feelings exist that they have a presence it's just i think a very true and honest expression of a self you know this discontent that we feel towards life and existence but gardens and cities useful as well as ordered are for me like cages in which the colored spontaneities of the trees and flowers have only enough room not to have any space enough not to escape and beauty all alone without the life that belongs to beauty by day i am nothing and by night i am i there is no difference between me and these streets save they being trees and i a soul which perhaps is irrelevant when we consider the essence of things there is an equal abstract destiny for people and for things both have an equally indifferent designation in the algebra of the world's mystery but there's something else in these languid and empty hours a sadness felt by my entire being rises 
from my soul to my mind. A bitter awareness that everything is a sensation of mine and at the same time something external, something not in my power to change. Next is the notion of dreams and imagination and how they can so effortlessly and profoundly become an antidote to all the ennui and the samenessness of life. A dream is something into which one plummets, especially when Pessoa writes that we are but eternal tourists of ourselves. There is no other landscape but what we are. And because we possess nothing, we don't even possess ourselves. In dreams, we may possess sensations that in reality are remote and alien. In short, for Pessoa, to dream is better, perhaps more fundamental than to participate in reality. Pessoa contemplates the world of dreaming, how its beauty is more real and worthy of altering our life in a more substantial way than the aims and purposes of reality. Pessoa finds different lanes for the reader to take sort of branching out and answering in an aesthetically contemplative manner perhaps what is the most fundamental question how to dream well next one is we cannot escape our sensations perhaps this you know this is probably the most hard hitting thing that to come out of the book of disquiet and that is that we cannot detach from our sensations no matter how stubbornly we try to rebel against how we feel no matter how high we climb or how low we descend we never escape our sensations we never disembark from ourselves we never attain another existence unless we other ourselves by actively vividly imagining who we are the true landscapes are those that we ourselves create since being their gods we see them as they truly are which is however we created them Whoever has crossed all the seas has only crossed the monotony of himself. All that we truly possess are our own sensations. It is in them rather than in what they sense that we must base our life's reality. To erase everything from the slate from one day to the next, to be new with each new morning in a perpetual revival of our emotional virginity. This and only this is worth being or having so as to be or have what we imperfectly are everything we feel you know all the people we meet all the experiences we have and don't are clothed in this in the uniformity of ourself this does clash with pessoa's notion of you know being one more than many but it makes a lot of sense when you understand what Pessoa meant by the tedium of life and how he connects that to the idea of just the fluidity and the multiplicity of a self. No one has yet defined tedium in a language comprehensible to those who have never experienced it. What some people call tedium is merely boredom. Others use the term to mean nagging discomfort. Still others consider tedium to be weariness. But while tedium includes weariness, discomfort and boredom, it doesn't resemble them any more than water resembles the hydrogen and oxygen that make it up. Tedium, yes, is boredom with the world, the nagging discomfort of living, the weariness of having lived. Tedium is indeed the carnal sensation of the complete emptiness of things. It's also the emptiness of something besides things and beings, the emptiness of the very soul that feels this void that feels itself to be this void and that within this void is nauseated and repelled by its own self. The Poetry of Fate and Hope Pessoa paints quite a bare portrait of fate and the role it plays in a person's life. It is both comfortless and comforting to be honest. It explains everything by being the perfect epitome of nothing. This impossibility of fate and the hopelessness of hope is felt throughout the book. Pessoa called himself, and I quote, a shelf of empty jars. It's just this awareness of bowing out of life so that even hope feels distant is very calming because Pessoa's writing in a lot of meandering ways shows you how even reality takes place outside the soul and every desire we try to identify with, be it love or traveling or ambition, is only that emptiness being numbed. 
It's a banishing from one's soul that forces us to place our hopes in the very notion of fate and chance and destiny and then proceed to play a part in that act. And it's so amazing because none of these things, you know, when you read about it, feel like Pessoa is trying too hard to make a point or he is, you know, just being cynical about these notions, these definitions just for the sake of it. I think that he's not nitpicking, he's not disparaging these things just to sound profound. And rather he's sort of peeling back the layers of his life as one should in order to arrive at a very lucid and just understanding, a very lucid understanding of words like, you know, what words like fate, what words like desire, hope and love really mean. And are they worth romanticizing about? It seems that fate has always made me love or want things just so that it could show me on the very next day that I didn't have or could never have them. But as an ironic spectator of myself, I've never lost interest in seeing what life brings. And since I now know beforehand that every vague hope will end in disillusion, I have the special delight of already enjoying the disillusion with the hope like the bitter with the sweet that makes the sweet sweeter by way of contrast. My destiny which has pursued me like a malevolent creature is to desire only what I know I'll never get. Some say that without hope life is impossible, others that with hope it's empty. For me, since I've stopped hoping or not hoping, life is simply an external picture that includes me and that I look at, like a show without a plot made only to please the eyes. An incoherent dance, leaves rustling in the wind, clouds in which the sky changes color, ancient streets that wind every which way around the city. I am, in large measure, the self-same prose I write. True nature of reality. Now, I'm not gonna say much about this, uh, just that reality, according to Pessoa, is all about questioning life's certainties and exactness. And I mean, it's a lot of things actually, but this is just one of the ways in which Pessoa really, you know, he turns the fa reality's facade inside out. It's often, you know, he sort of sheds light on all those things that we often hide away from, you know, just sort of turn away from our reflection in the mirror when we talk about just the nature of reality and what it is and what it isn't. To recognize reality as a form of illusion, an illusion as a form of reality is equally necessary and equally useless. Anything and everything, depending on how one sees it, is a marvel or a hindrance, an all or a nothing, a path or a problem. To see something in constantly new ways is to renew and multiply it. That is why the contemplative person, without ever leaving his village, will nevertheless have the whole universe at his disposal. There's infinity in a cell or a desert. One can sleep cosmically against a rock. But there are times in our meditation when everything is suddenly worn out, old, seen and reseen, even though we have yet to see it. And we also have our nights, and the profound weariness produced by emotions become even more profound, since in this case the emotions come from thought. But it's a night without sleep or moon or stars, a night as if all had been turned inside out, infinity internalized and ready to burst, and the day converted into the black lining of an unfamiliar suit. Yes, it's always better to be the human being that loves what it doesn't know, the leech that's unaware of how repugnant it is, to ignore so as to live, to feel in order to forget. Next element is just the heaviness of feeling, which is, which, which is very synonymous in the book with Pessoa's portrait of longing. Now there is this dimension of uh, Do Pessoa's writing where he talks about the intensity of his feelings and his awareness of them as being two very different, you know, separate sensations, and and through this very thought he perfectly describes what it means to feel your feelings. Leaning back in my chair, I forget the life that oppresses me. Nothing pains me besides having felt pain. And when I plunge into one of these abysses, that is ways of being a person, I suddenly feel helpless and empty, as if I had died and yet I live. 
a pained and pale shadow which the first breeze will knock to the ground and the first physical contact will dissolve into dust. The life of the mind joined together with descriptions of nature like rain and wind, clouds, sunlight are quite cathartic. Pessoa splits the current of living and being between feelings of solitude, despair and inertia on one side and very intense and detailed imagery on the other side. He really softens the edges of life, existence, romantic happiness and other human aspirations which he renders trivial and inconclusive in comparison to the life of the mind. The sensibility with which Pessoa gets at this indifference of the world through the lens of nature and you know describing various colors of the sky, the fog, the storm and trees is just worth rereading and remembering. I realized uh, because I read this, I've, I've read this book two times now, that the second half of the book reiterates a lot that is has already been explained in the first half of the book. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's just that Pessoa looks at this, those subjects in a different way in the second half, which is very interesting to read, to say the least. But you know, at certain moments, you do feel that it's a bit repetitive. But I, I see the point in that as well because I think that. What Pessoa is getting at is he's merely reflecting just life and just the monotony of life in his writings. So the, the repetitions themselves are metaphors for all the things that Pessoa is writing about. The tedium of life and the shapelessness of existence. You also get a glimpse of Pessoa as you're reading the Book of Disquiet, which is kind of the point and you know, I think Honestly, I could go on and on about the Book of Disquiet. There's just so much to unpack. I think that's the beauty of the Book of Disquiet. The language evolves with you. On that note, I end this video. Um, thank you so much for putting up with me and watching this video all the way through. Uh, if you have any recommendations for me, please put them down in the comments below. And also, I would like to thank our patrons or reader members, as I like to call them. If you don't already know, uh, we do have a Patreon page. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video. And uh, yeah, this is Aisha from Reader Day Club. And I'll see you guys next time.